everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am going to introduce our presenter for today. So Dr. Smith is here today, and but he's originally from South Florida and went to Northwestern. So he got his DVM and then he finished his training at Cornell and he's been working in lower Manhattan at the downtown veterinary group since then, which is an amazing vet practice in New York city. If you ever happen to be here, <laughs> lives in Brooklyn with his wife and large orange cat. And in his downtime, he likes to run, cook and try to convince his cat to play. I love that. But with that, I am going to hand things off to Dr. Smith. Thanks for everybody to for coming in. I might have to apologize in advance that it is, speaking of my large orange cat, it is close to his dinner time. So if he starts to scream like he's never been fed before, don't believe him. Today, I just wanted to go over some basics of just some simple things to know at home of first aid stuff that might be helpful in situations where you're not really sure what to do or how serious things should be um, and sort of some simple tricks that you might have at home that you can kind of help stabilize things so that you can feel a little bit more comfortable. I do work at, in Manhattan, two different practices, the Seaport Animal Hospital and the West Village Veterinary Hospital. I kind of bounce back and forth at the moment. If anybody is in the area, feel free to drop by. So I figured what I would do is I would start my presentation with going over some of the, the basics of just what is normal and what is abnormal so that you can sort of tell the difference between is this something that is trending in a direction that we are worried about or is this something that we actually need to take care of and so the first thing is just sort of knowing what basic vital signs are or what we call tpr which is temperature pulse and respiration trying to uh to figure out what those values are and such oftentimes a little bit hard and so in order to try to get the heart rate on your pet Oftentimes they'll have owners place their hand on the chest and you can oftentimes feel the heartbeat through there. Now, in some situations, they are got a little extra padding on there. You might not be able to feel that quite as readily. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second of ways to get a pulse in other ways, but oftentimes we want to know a value over the course of about a minute. And so oftentimes what I'll have owners do is place their hand on their chest. The heart is kind of near the sternum and on the left side a little bit. Um, so it's gonna be easier to feel if you keep your hand on the left side. And usually what I'll have owners do is count out about 15 seconds and count how many times you're feeling that heartbeat. And then you multiply by four and you'll get a sense of what's happening over the course of a minute. That way you don't have to wait a full minute to get that full value. Same thing with the respiration. I usually have owners watch their chest rise and fall. So a full rise and a full fall will be one breath. And then you take that number over the course of 15 seconds, multiply by four, and you get a sense of what's happening over the course of a minute. Other simple things that you can do to just get a sense of what's going on with your pet is actually lifting up their lip. Their gums have a lot of little capillaries going through them. And so if there are some changes in their pulse or their blood pressure and such, oftentimes their gums should be pretty bright pink. And so oftentimes I'll have owners just take a look at what they look like normally when they're healthy and happy in other ways, and just lift up their lip just to get a sense of things. If in a situation where you need to take a look at things, lift up their lip. And also what you can do is you can just sort of depress your finger on that and it should blanch briefly. Um, and then it should kind of come back to pink pretty quickly within two seconds or so. If there's a delay in that, if those gums or that tongue kind of look either very purple or blue, or they seem very, very pale to you compared to what you see right now when they're otherwise healthy, gives you kind of a sense of maybe other things that are going on or their perfusion or their blood pressure, things like that. Now, if you can't really feel their heart very well and can't get a sense of their heartbeat, you can check their pulses, which is actually between their thighs. Um, there is what's called the femoral artery. And so oftentimes I will have owners when they are healthy and otherwise feeling okay, just sort of kind of put your fingers between their thigh um, on the inside there and try to feel around for a low pulse. You don't have to push down too hard, just sort of lightly. And then if you don't feel it, just sort of press a little bit harder, um, just slightly to sometimes feel a little pulse going through there. You can kind of get a sense of things. That should be, should match what's going on with the heart rate as well. And you'll feel that little pulse going on. So you can do the same calculation. With temperature, now, the best way to do it is a rectal temperature. Most dogs are not really happy about that. Make sure that you use some Vaseline or something that you might have on hand. And I would try to avoid the old school thermometers of the, the mercury ones. You just don't want that to break in those situations. Alternatively, you can actually try to get it under the armpit. So you can just sort of stick a 
the uh, thermometer under the armpit and keep it there for about until it, it goes off. Usually with that, it's not as accurate. So usually we'll have owners add a degree to that just to get a sense of things. Or what we've actually been starting to do is if you have one of the newer ear thermometers, that's a pretty accurate estimation of things. So you can actually put it into their ear and get a sense of things that way. So that's a good way just to get a sense of their, their temperature. And so this is what we would consider a normal vital signs for a dog. And so I already see some people taking some pictures of that area. That's one of the, the benefits of doing this online. You can take a screenshot of it. It's always good to sort of be able to look back on their heart rate anywhere, usually between 70 and 160, respiratory rate anywhere between 15 and 40 within a course of a minute. And their temperature is actually a range much higher than ours. And so 99 and a half to one and two and a half is usually the, the common things. Now, with respect to these values, you have to sort of take them in context with what's going on in the situation. If we have a dog who has just been running around at the dog park where it's a really hot day, their heart rate or their respiratory rate might be a little bit higher, or they might be panting. So that might actually go outside of these ranges. Temperature might be a little bit higher. And so you kind of have to base it based on the situation. Also stress will increase that. So oftentimes a lot of our dogs and cats coming into the hospital will be a little bit stressed, understandably. And so some, sometimes these values will be a little bit higher just because they are a little bit stressed. This is also, I know we are sort of focused on dogs today, but I know a lot of you probably also have cats. And so these are the common sort of the normal vital parameters for a cat. Their heart rate tends to be a little bit higher. And so just sort of take that into context. Their temperature also is a little bit higher than ours, but same as dogs. So 99 and a half to 102 and a half. In terms of first aid, I figured that I would sort of focus today, um, or at least start with what's probably most beneficial right now with Halloween coming up in a few days. And so chocolate ingestion is might be something you may come across sometime soon. And chocolate ingestion is it's a hard one because there is a spectrum in terms of how it can affect our dogs. And the toxicity and the severity of it oftentimes develop depends a little bit on the size of your pup, the kind of chocolate they're getting, if it's a milk chocolate versus a dark chocolate, and then the amount that they're getting. And so there is a huge spectrum. The lower end of the signs, if they get just a small dose of it, we can just have a little bit of an upset stomach, a bit of vomiting and diarrhea, their, their appetite may be thrown off for a little bit, but oftentimes that passes pretty quickly. Going up from there, as the dose gets a little bit higher, we start to see agitation. It starts to make them, make them restless and their heart starts to beat a lot faster. And so now that you know how to get a heart rate on them and get a sense of that, if you start to see those signs, that might be suggesting that we're actually getting a higher dose of things. The highest dose though, is when things got, start to get really bad. You start to see arrhythmias, so the heart starts to beat abnormally as it's going really fast. They get what's called ataxia. And so they have a drunken walk, they sort of stagger around. And then it starts to turn into neurologic signs where we start to see seizures. With with all chocolate, there is a dose calculator online that you could try. It will help you, you can plug in your pup's weight. If you have a sense of what the kind of chocolate is, it can give you a sense of, of how severe it is. But unless you're using Baker's chocolate or you have a pure chocolate bar, it oftentimes is really hard to know exactly what they're getting or how much is in there. And so on the next slide, as you go down, we can kind of continue on with other toxins or poisons that they ingest. And so if it gets to a point where you're not quite sure how much they got into at the bottom of this page here, as you can see, there is poison control. There are two different places that you can call. And what they can do is they can help you walk through everything. They'll ask you the weight, how much they got, and they have, they're really beneficial because they have a lot of proprietary information that a lot of companies will provide just to them about concentrations of things that may not be obvious or be readily searchable. And so they can really talk you through a lot of things. And that's true for a lot of any other toxins that you're worried about. Um, so other common things that we'll see are grapes and raisins for dogs, onions and garlic, um, chocolate, obviously, especially with Halloween coming up, xylitol. So any of those sugar-free candies or gums that are out there that can cause a lot of issues with dogs. Any household medications like NSAIDs, which kind of include Tylenol, Advil, Aleve, aspirin, things like that. Or if you're in a place where there is antifreeze, where there's puddles of bright green liquid outside that they could have been drinking out of, those can cause issues. 
If you have any cats, things like lilies and such can also cause some poisoning. And so this is just a good resource to have. It's actually a good resource for us because what oftentimes happens is we'll have owners call in to the poison control and they will either make the recommendation of going into see your vet or not. And if they, if they do recommend seeing us, then we actually can call them and they can give us some more information about that proprietary thing of how to treat this, what doses to use, things like that for that specific toxin. So it's a really good resource. Just know that there is a cost involved with this whenever you call them. If your pup eats something and you catch them pretty immediately and you think that you can get on top of it, you can try to induce vomiting. Now, the easiest way to do that at home is to use hydrogen peroxide. Usually is good to be fairly up-to-date bottle of hydrogen peroxide because I know a lot of people will buy one and have it sit there for years. It can go bad and just sort of be less efficacious. And so the dose here is about one milliliter per pound. And so that kind of depends on the size of your dog. If you have a syringe or some way to kind of squirt it into their mouth, you can do that. Sometimes after doing that, we'll have owners try to spin them around or try to move them around a little bit just to try to make them a little bit nauseous and can kind of encourage that. Now with that, I usually only have owners do it once. Reason being is that if you do it multiple times and try to give them multiple doses of the hydrogen peroxide, it can actually cause some irritation in the mouth and in the back of the throat. And so you don't really want to try to do that. So one time is, is good. If that doesn't do it, then you might need to see your vet where they, we have some injectable things or some other versions of things that may be more beneficial. Now, all that being said, if your dog ate something that is caustic and could be irritating on the way down, we don't necessarily want to cause irritation on the way up. And so in those situations where it's a cleaning solution or something that could cause some irritation, I would probably try to avoid that. I saw somebody ask if, the, if we should dilute the hydrogen peroxide. I wouldn't. I would sort of use it straight up. Uh, that's the best way to get the best results from that. Also, obviously, if your pet is unconscious, we don't want to induce involvement at that point. And so just something to definitely avoid that if you can. Because we're talking about Halloween and maybe getting into things that might cause a little bit of vomiting and diarrhea, that's probably the most common thing that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is vomiting and diarrhea. Our dogs are low to the ground, they can get into things. And a lot of times for very mild cases, a lot of times they can kind of get back to normal and may not need vet care. But the severity really depends on how they're doing and the severity of the, the presentation of some of the symptoms. One of the common side effects of vomiting and diarrhea is dehydration. And people ask me about that a lot. So some of the things that are good little you know, rules of thumb to determine their level of dehydration is that their gums under normal circumstances should be pink and moist. And so if you lift it up, you should sort of press your finger there. You'll kind of feel it's a little bit uh, wet there. If it becomes dry and tacky, they might be a little bit dehydrated. Sometimes in really severe dehydration, we'll actually see the eyes sink in a little bit. And then there's a thing called the skin turgor test or skin tenting test. And so that's when you grab them by the scruff between the, the shoulder blades on their back there. And most times when you pull that up, it should pop back. And that's when they're really well hydrated, things just sort of go back to normal. Occasionally when you pull that up, the skin will kind of tent for a little bit and take a, its time to go down. And so that those are just rough little estimates to kind of get a sense of their hydration status. And so if you're seeing any of those symptoms, then it might suggest that they are trending towards being a little bit drier than we want them to be. Obviously, if you have any questions about this, call your vet. They'll help you out with that. In really mild cases of vomiting and diarrhea, oftentimes what I'll recommend is just sort of remove water and food and water for a little bit. If they are vomiting actively, then I definitely don't want anything to go into their mouth during that time. If it's just a little bit of diarrhea, you can certainly offer some water because you don't want to give that, get them dehydrated. But with the vomiting, we really want to avoid trying to add ammunition to what's going on. If there has been no vomiting or diarrhea for about six to eight hours, letting everything calm down, then you can start to gradually introduce a little bit of water and maybe a little bit of food. I usually recommend some bland food, something that's easy to digest during that time, um, not as rich as their regular food. And so it's something that I would say bland, small, and just wait a little bit before offering to them. People ask me about Pepsid, which is a human antacid. That's great in a lot of situations, but if they are actively vomiting, then they oftentimes won't keep it down. 
And I would usually recommend trying to just touch base with your vet to sort of figure out the dose based on your dog. It's sometimes good just to have a sense of what the dose is in the future, even if they're not actively vomiting, you know, when you go in for your regular checkups and such, they can sometimes give you a sense of what in those situations you can reach for. Obviously if things are not getting any better or we're vomiting multiple times, or if we're trying to bring something up and can't, or you're starting to see a lot of blood in the poop or, or in the vomit, then definitely in those situations, I'd probably have you go into the vet. I know some people were asking about what are reasons behind blood in the poop. It could be a variety. It's something where sometimes a little bit of blood is, is not as worrisome. If it's m- mostly blood coming up, and that's definitely worrisome. I usually tell people diarrhea is really irritating to the colon. And so especially dogs who have multiple episodes of diarrhea, it causes so much irritation, a little bit of blood might start to, to leak in there. But I, I do think that erring on the side of caution, if you start to see blood, it's probably not wrong just to see your vet just to get on top of it before it progresses. Now with wounds, this is something where it depends on the situation and how severe things are. I usually really recommend that depending on the severity of the wound, just be careful because your pup might be stressed and anxious and painful and scared. And so even though you are their parent and they know you really well, they also might be really ouchy. And so you trying to interact with them at that time, they might just lash out and that's not anything against you. It's just something that they are not really paying attention or aware of. So just be very careful during that time, whenever there is any wound that's going on. If there is a wound that they allow you to touch and there is active bleeding, then pressure is the best way to do so. So you can either put your hand on that area, or if you have something to sort of put over it, some bandaging bandaging material to sort of apply some pressure that will help the body create some clots in that area and stop the bleeding. If it's on a limb that you can actually elevate a little bit, that sometimes will help, but direct pressure is really the way to go if that's continuing on. Trying to keep that area still. Now it depends on where the wound might be. Animals, they're wiggly, they move around, they do what they want to do. And so sometimes you can get a wound to stop bleeding, but then if they start to move around a lot, or if it's on a limb where there's a lot of movement in that area, it can start to bleed again. So trying to immobilize that area is is oftentimes beneficial. Trying not to disturb any clots that start to form. And so that means you not messing with it any further if you can, or keeping them away from it so they're not licking it or biting at it and such. That can knock off some of those little clots that is the body's way of stopping the bleeding and helping to start the healing process. And so keeping them away from it oftentimes is really important. We're going to talk about bandaging in a second. So if you have any bandaging material, you can try to do that. Bandaging on pets is difficult. It's a lot better. It's a lot easier on the limbs than it is on the body or on the tail or on the ear or on the face or on the neck. Bandage as best you can if you're worried about it, and then definitely bring it to the vet. Sometimes depending on the situation, we will MacGyver something to try to cover that area. And we'll talk about bandaging a little bit. So if you are going to be bandaging something at home, once the bleeding stops and you let it kind of calm down for a second, you can try to clean it pretty well, just depending on the situation, especially if there's any dirt or anything in there, dry it thoroughly before you bandage it. You don't want to trap any moisture in there. And so before you put anything on there, you definitely want to dry it really well. And bandaging can really help protect them from licking at that, any further irritation or anything kind of in the environment that couldn't get into there. Like I said, bandaging is going to be easiest for you probably on one of the limbs and usually wherever, and I'll have like a little picture of it later, wherever the the wound is, we oftentimes want to try to extend the bandage one joint above that area, kind of closer to the body area, because if you just do it in the area itself, it can oftentimes slip. And so pushing it over the the joint itself oftentimes will help keep it in, in place. We also don't want to make it too tight where it can cause like a little tourniquet action because that can stop all the blood flow in that area. It can cause some swelling in the area. And oftentimes when bandages shift, they can start to cinch down on themselves. So it's something to be very aware of. And so you don't definitely want to tie it way too tight. When we do any bandaging, 
we oftentimes try to focus on three layers, which is a contact layer, an absorbent layer, and an outer layer. Now, by the contact layer, what that is, it's a non-adhesive pad that we oftentimes will put onto the, the wound itself. And these are things that you can probably find at most pharmacies and such. One that we use is something called a Telfa pad or something, as you see here, a non-adhesive pad. And these are really helpful because they, they help wick things away from the area but also when the time comes that you are taking off the bandage, it doesn't also peel off the, the scab that's forming in that area. So it actually can be really helpful when you are changing the bandage or if you need to change the bandage. So it's good to sometimes have some of these on hand in case of anything going on. The next layer is the absorbent layer. And so that's usually a cotton material, it's, we call it cast padding or it's, it's sort of rolled gauze. And that one, when you start to roll it around, just make sure that it's all flat and even when you do so, because if you have any little wrinkles that are going in there, that can start to cause more irritation and then they wanna bite at it, they wanna chew at it because it's kind of itchy. So trying to keep it as flat as possible. And then when you are applying it, especially when you're doing it on the limb, you wanna start at the furthest tip of the leg. So if you are going at the bottom of the leg, start with the toes and move your way up. If you start with the top and go down, kind of forms a cone action. And that actually allows it to slip down a little bit better. When you do apply that bandaging, just try to keep at least a couple toes. Usually I have like the two middle toes stick out because that way, like I said, sometimes bandaging will create a tourniquet effect. And this allows us to keep an eye on those toes. So if those toes start to seem really swollen, that tells us that it might be cinching a little bit too tight. We need to back off and maybe unwrap and rewrap the things. The outer layer, are things like ACE bandages. We use something that's called vet wrap, which sort of grabs onto itself. And this is just sort of a protective layer on the outside. These things can be stretchy and have a lot of give to them, but they also can be really tight. And so just be really careful when you are applying those, if you do get any of those, um, because those can, especially if they start to move or cinch up on their own, those alone can sometimes be a little bit a tourniquet effect. And this is just a, a quick visual. So you're starting at the bottom of the, the leg and you oftentimes in this situation, you wanna go above the joint that you're acting on. So this one could be kind of around the ankle area, but we're going above the knee there so that we can make sure that it stays on. Um, now I see somebody's asking about bandaging an ear. That is one of the hardest things that we have to do. I have tried it many times, nothing seems to stay on. There are some products out there that are called things like no flap ear wrap. They're, they're almost an elastic head covering that will press the ear to the top of the head. And that way it keeps them from shaking around their head. So if they have kind of floppy ears, what happens is that they flop their ears, they are smacking against the head, they're breaking up a little clots, they're causing a little bit of bleeding. So oftentimes keeping them cinched down towards the head is a little bit easier. So there are products out there that can sometimes help. It really kind of depends on the situation, but ears and tails, I've tried many times, they really don't stay on. They're really frustrating, but that's the only thing that I can sort of recommend in that situation. This is probably the most important and probably hopefully the one that you never have to deal with and that's CPR. So if for some reason your dog collapses and is not breathing or you don't feel a heart rate, then you can start CPR at home. Obviously the most immediate thing is to try to contact the vet and let them know that you're on your way over and bring them in as quickly as possible. There are other things that we can do that you might not be able to do at home. But usually when I talk about CPR, the acronym that that's more important than CPR is ABC, which is the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. And so the airway, we want to make sure that they're able to get air whenever we do it. Breathing, we want to try to encourage their breathing. And circulation is trying to start chest compressions to act in the place of the heart if it's not pumping itself. So let's talk about airway. So airway is just trying to open up as much as we can. So oftentimes we'll have you tilt their head back as much as possible. That sort of opens up their esophagus. I mean, their, their trachea and, and allow for as much smooth airflow. You, you can actually pull out their tongue a little bit. You can see on this little kind of gross diagram, you can see that the tongue forms a little ridge at the back of the mouth. And so that also kind of constricts the airway in that area. So if you pull it out, that opens up some of that airway. 
And oftentimes what I'll have owners do is I'll have owners do a little finger sweep where you actually put your finger into the back of their mouth in case they did choke on something or there is anything back there. Obviously, if they're awake and they are stressed and they are worried, then I would probably not do that because I don't want them to bite you accidentally unless you obviously saw something go in there. You just have to be very cautious. If they are collapsed and not aware of things, then you can feel a little bit more comfortable going back in there and sort of doing a little finger sweep just briefly. Now with breathing, this is a little bit harder to do at home, but there are ways that you can help facilitate that. So obviously if they're breathing on their own, there is nothing that you need to do in terms of trying to help facilitate that or encourage that. Just try to position them in a way that they're comfortable and tries to open up their airways a little bit, make sure that they're cool. If they're not, then you actually can do a little bit of CPR in terms of trying to blow into their, their mouth. And so you're actually blowing into their nose. And so what you'll do is you'll close their their entire muzzle and you'll form like a little seal by putting your hand over that area and you'll be blowing into their nose that way. And the rate that we're looking for is about six to 10 breaths per minute. So one every eight to 10 seconds or so. Keep doing that until we're breathing on our own or until you get to the vet. Okay. So you can just sort of form that little seal there, get out any air into them as you possibly can. If you have to do chest compressions, if you hold your hand on their chest, you feel no heart rate. If you put your fingers between their, their thighs and you don't feel a pulse going on and you think that they do need chest compressions, then you can start that. Every dog's a little bit different in terms of their shape and in terms of their size. And so we'll talk about a little bit more specifics here about size and shape of your dog. But oftentimes we'll actually have you lie them on their side. You actually have to put your hands and use the, the palm of your hand to put onto the top of their chest, sort of the highest point. And then you actually really push down. You gotta put a lot of pressure into it and you'll actually feel their, their ribs kind of bow a little bit along with that. You need the pressure that you're creating in that area by pushing down on the ribs to help squeeze that heart and pump it for you. The rate that we're going at is staying alive, which is about 120 beats per minute. This is a very exhausting thing. It's something that you will find yourself getting tired very quickly. And so if there are other people around you, we usually recommend trying to do it for about two minute intervals at a time and switch off. Even if you feel like you are keeping up with it and you feel good, you can start to get tired. You can start to fall out of beat and out of rhythm. And so you may not be doing it as quickly as you need to do. So it is something that if you have somebody with you at the time, then I would try to switch off if you can. Now, with respect to, to different dogs and such, the average dog lying on them on their side and, and pressing on the sort of the top of their chest is good for most dogs. Now for, as you can see on, I guess, letter C there, that's a bulldog there. So the, the smaller dogs that have a barrel chest, that have a, a wider chest, oftentimes actually rolling them onto their back and pressing onto the sternum is going to have a better effect for that because you're going to have a better angle of, of pressure at that moment. And so that's going to be really great for really tiny dogs though. If you have like a little Chihuahua or a little Yorkie or something like that, obviously you don't want to put your full pressure on that area. Some of those you can actually use your whole hand and you can compress the entire chest itself. That's true of cats as well. Depending on your hand strength, you can actually grab all the way around and do that pump that way. Um, so obviously you don't want to put too much pressure on that area, but it is something that depending on the size of the dog and the situation, you have to kind of adapt to that. There's also what looks like a whippet there where they have a really narrow chest. And for those, we want to focus more on like the top one third of the chest where it is the widest, I guess, or the deepest that you can. And that's going to be the best way. This is kind of what I was talking about, where if there's two people, you want to kind of switch off as much as you can. Usually what you'll be doing is you'll be doing a few pumps on the chest and then give a breath and go back and forth. If you have two people, then one person could be giving the breath and while one person just continues doing the chest compressions the entire time. And obviously you swap back and forth if you can. And this is something where if you can get them into the vet as quickly as possible, we'll do what we can to help stabilize them and see if we can bring them back. If you've been doing it for 15, 20 minutes and you're not getting the response, then at that point, then unfortunately, I think continuing is not going to do us too much. Usually what I'll have owners do is every few minutes of doing this, stop and reassess things. 
reassess if they have started to breathe on their own, start to feel their chest, feel those pulses, see if you've kick-started something. But again, if it keeps going and you are not seeing the response that you wanted to after 15, 20 minutes, it, it may not be worthwhile to keep going. And then I've also gotten questions about how you transport an injured pet. This also depends on the situation, depends on the size of your pet. If they are hurt or injured, you know, you want to try to move them around as little as possible. If they are vomiting and such, you don't want to put a lot of pressure onto their belly. So picking them up on the belly, you want to avoid that. So sometimes we want to have one hand under their chest and maybe one hand under their butt, just depending on their size. If there's an injury in the back or a wound, we don't want to touch that area or in the back, we want to really try to stabilize them. If they have vomited or continuing to vomit and, or they're going unconscious and had been vomiting, you want to try to tilt them forward. So that gravity kind of keeps things coming down. So it doesn't go back into them and that they aspirate. If they're immobile, if you can find some way to transport them, you know, if it's a small dog, you put them into a carrier. If it's a larger dog, if you... I live in New York city, so people don't have garages, but if you have a board or if you even have like a ironing board, sometimes you can strap them to that. So actually securing them to that, or even if you have a really big blanket, you can kind of wrap it around them and form a sling that you can kind of carry them that way. Again, depends on the situation, depends on how severe they are, how responsive they are. Uh, but if they are really injured or they can't move around, then I would try to minimize motion as much as possible. And then what, what sort of things are beneficial to have at home? Not bad to have some rubber gloves, ice packs if there's some bruising and such or if they're uncomfortable, um, some antiseptic if there is a wound, some scissors that are blunt so that they move around, you don't poke them. But if you are cutting some bandaging material, it's good to have those. Some saline eye wash. So if there is something that gets into their eye or they're squinting, something that is saline that has no additives to it, I think is the best way to flush those eyes. Some bandaging material. So some of the things that we were talking about, the ace bandage or the vet wrap, um, some telfa pads, some of that roll gauze. You can also keep on hand some antibiotic ointment. Now that's good for wounds and depending on the situation, it is something we were talking to Sonali earlier that wouldn't put that in the eye, something just to avoid the eye, but some of them are a little bit more okay than others, but I would just sort of avoid things in the eye in terms of that. Thermometers, again, I would avoid any of the mercury ones that are old and you probably can't even get anymore, but there are some that you can do in the ear or some of the digital ones you can put under the armpit or, or even in the butt if they allow you. It's not wrong for your pup to have a muzzle on their size, just depending on even if they are the best behaved, if they are painful and such, they may try to bite. And so it's not wrong just to have a version for them. Uh, hydrogen peroxide if they're eating anything and just balls and towels, basic things just to have around the house. Man, I think that might be it for me. These are just some, some simple things that I thought might be good coverage for a lot of common things that we'll see at home and just sort of good things to know and, and reach for. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye.